and uh, this show is going to be on the IRS since that's my one of my favorite topics and we're going to look at um, uh, the tax man cometh so I've done a show previous to this one on the IRS taxing issue and it's available on my YouTube channel which is linked at ronintruthblogspot.com so here we are with the um, the law comes from the Constitution, right? The Constitution is the law, at least the government is bound by the Constitution. All legislation must come under the authority of the U.S. Constitution. In the Supreme Court decision, it's so stated, and here we have it. You can see, quote, if courts are to regard the Constitution and the Constitution is superior to any ordinary act of the legislature. The Constitution and not such ordinary act must govern the case to which they both apply. Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137 in 1803. Now, if Congress passes a legislative act and it's unconstitutional, then it doesn't apply. So what I'm going to tell you is that you can argue that it doesn't apply and that you don't have to honor it as long as it doesn't fall under the authority of the Constitution. So how come you have to pay taxes? Can you state any reasons why you have a group of men and women that can take the fruit of your labor? Are you not entitled to keep the fruit of your labor? The federal government was formed in 1787 and the Bill of Rights was added in 1791. When was the first income tax applied to the people of the United States of America? Can you guess what year that would be? The first national federal tax on labor was attempted in 1862, right around the Civil War time, to pay the large war debt amassed by the federal government. It applied only to federal employees, as Congress could only legislate laws for people living in Washington, D.C., or its territories and possessions, or federal employees. I mean, if you're an employee of Walmart, you have to obey Walmart's policies, right? So if you're an employee of the federal government, you have to obey the federal government's policies. That's kind of like if you're going to take the job, it's voluntary. You're taking the job. You have to obey the policy. The Civil War soldiers are federal employees and had the first withholding taxes taken from their paychecks. This tax was repealed and reenacted in 1894 and promptly ruled unconstitutional in the Supreme Court that case that followed Pollock versus Farmers Loan and Trust. So let's take a look at that. And uh, here we have it here. The tax imposed by sections 27 to 37 inclusive of the Act of 1894, so far as it falls on the income of real estate and of personal property, well, your labor would be personal property, correct? being a direct tax within the meaning of the Constitution and therefore unconstitutional and void, because not apportioned according to representation, all those sections constituting one entire scheme of taxation are necessarily invalid. So, now we've seen that the Supreme Court ruled that a direct tax was invalid and a direct tax on the labor. So how did the federal government sustain it, its financial needs, from 1787 until the 1940s, more or less, when taxation became somewhat prevalent in the United States as applying to, you know, your average man, the common man? Where did they get their money? I mean, obviously they needed money to run the government, but what did they do for all that time? I mean, people think that taxes have been going on since day one, but that's not true. Why didn't they attempt taking tax money from the people before that? 
Does anybody actually think they never thought to tax the people before that? They collected import duties and excise taxes. Excise taxes are a tax that you are not required to pay but choose to pay for some item you choose to purchase. For example, you're not required to buy jewelry. Jewelry is a luxury. And if you choose to buy jewelry, you have to pay an excise tax on it. You can avoid paying the tax if you avoid buying the jewelry. You are not required to buy gasoline. It's your choice to have a motor-powered conveyance to travel in, and your excise tax on the gasoline pays for the construction of the roads and bridges that service those wishing to travel in motor-powered conveyances on the public roads. The catch is, it is unconstitutional to levy a direct tax and anything unconstitutional has no authority in law. They can't force you to pay a tax. So let's move to understanding the 14th Amendment. This amendment was never ratified because the southern states who voted upon it declined to support it until the military stepped in and removed the governors that were lawfully elected in those states and replaced them with puppet governors who would vote for them. So let's take a look at the 14th Amendment. Amendment 14, passed by Congress June 13, 1866, ratified July 9, 1868, but we actually know it was never ratified. Section 1, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Now, I want you to notice the key words here. One is persons, because persons has a definition in 1787, and then that definition changed in 1860s when they started the four. Okay, now let's look at the definition in black law of person. Right down here, term may include artificial beings as corporations, and you thought persons weren't corporations. A person born or naturalized in the United States, can a corporation be born? You know, probably not, but uh, we would call, a, you know, the birth of Bank of America at such and such a point. And subject to the jurisdiction thereof. It doesn't say, it does not say all persons, all men or women born or naturalized in the United States and or are subject to the jurisdiction as citizens of the United States. So if we take that backwards and go citizens of the United States that are subject to the jurisdiction of, of the United States, you know, are 14th Amendment citizens. Then we go to the section 4 which says the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment or of, of pensions and bounties for services in the suppressing insurrection of rebellion, shall not be questioned. Now, why would they put that in there? Because you have a right to question any debt that's been laid on you. Somebody's going to have to prove that you're responsible for a debt, aren't they? That's the whole point of debt. If I come to you and say you owe me money, you're going to say, I don't owe you any money. So you're, you're, you're going to say, prove that I owe you money. And if I can't prove that you owe me money, then you don't have a debt to me. Now, would it be difficult for the federal government to prove that you owed them money? Yeah, because in order to prove that you have a debt to them, they'd have to have a contract that you entered into. And lacking proof that they have a contract that you signed voluntarily to enter into, you don't owe a debt. Debts are all contractual obligations. So the federal government would like you to be a slave. So you are a slave to the federal government as noted when it states subject to the jurisdiction if you are a United States citizen and you can't question the public debt. Pretty sneaky. 
because they get you to claim you to testify that you are a United States citizen. In other words, the federal government can borrow all the money it wants and spend it any way they choose if you are a United States citizen. This is a big deal. You can't question the debt or refuse to pay, i.e. pay taxes. The next question is, are you required to be a United States citizen? Do you have free will? Are you a common law free man on the land? Are you a public vessel in commerce? What does the 13th Amendment to the Constitution say? Here we have the 13th Amendment. Section 1, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. That says you can't be an involuntary, you can't have involuntary servitude. Does it say you can't volunteer to be a slave? doesn't say anywhere that you can't volunteer to be a slave. Why is that important? Because they want to be able to come back on you and tell you that you're testifying. When I, when I ask you if you were a United States citizen and you said, yeah, you just testified that you were a slave without maybe knowing it, but you're the one that's giving the testimony. So since slavery is abolished, Unless I volunteer to be in servitude, I can't be made into a serf subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Did I volunteer into servitude? The maximum of law is failure to deny is to admit. You have to object expressly or you have acquiesced and implied you are okay with the state of things. I mean, if somebody says you killed my brother and you don't say, no, I'm innocent, you have to say, no, I'm innocent. If you remain mute, then you're guilty. Because the only testimony heard is that you committed a crime and you killed my brother. So are you okay with the IRS taking your money? Have you ever objected to the IRS taking your money in writing? Some way you can prove that you objected. Can you prove that you objected? How powerful is the U.S. Constitution? Did you sign it and agree to it? If you're not a party that contracted to the, and it has, it has no meaning in your life. You didn't sign the Constitution, so it's not a contract that you agreed to. But this is not really a problem because you know who did agree to the Constitution, to, to be bound by the Constitution? Can you guess? Every public official who is elected or appointed has to take an oath to support the Constitution. So even though you don't have a contract, they offered to support the Constitution. That's a contract. They made an offer. It's just waiting for your acceptance to become a binding contract. If you don't accept it, then they just made a declaration. I promise I'm going to do this thing. But if they make a promise that they're going to give something of consideration for, in exchange for getting something of consideration, what are they getting? They're getting a paycheck. That's consideration. They're getting consideration for their oath. And they, that oath is an offer to contract. But it's only a contract if you agree to it. So you have to get their oath and sign across their oath that I accept their oath. So if you get a copy of any government official's oath of office and write across it, I accept this, John Doe's oath of office as a binding bilateral contract, signed without prejudice, Henry Rowe, and date it. Now you have a contract to honor the Constitution, and if that's broken, woe be to him that breaks it. This is, the most, this is at most treason and at least perjury. It's perjury because he swore to honor the Constitution and then didn't do it. That would be lying. Perjury is lying. The U.S. Constitution and the state constitutions note that no laws can impair the obligations of contracts. Here we have the Black's Law fourth definition of contract. An agreement between two or more parties, preliminary step in making of which is offer by one and acceptance by the other, in which minds of the parties meet and concur in understanding of terms. 
Lee versus Travelers Insurance Company of Hartford, Connecticut. And it is an agreement creating obligation in which there must be competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration, mutuality of agreement, and mutuality of obligation. An agreement must not be so vague or uncertain that terms are not ascertainable. It's right in the Constitution. So let's put some contracts with the IRS into force. I like contracts. Anytime a party sends you a claim that you owe a debt, they are stating they are in contract with you. If you demand to see proof of that claim, that they are, they, they are required to show it to you. Otherwise, it would be fraudulent to claim a debt owed without proof. Let's see this is an example. If I send my neighbor a notice of debt owed and demand he pay me $1,000 for cutting his lawn, failure to pay will add in a penalty of $200 per month until the debt uh, is paid, what will my neighbor do with my demand? He'll throw it in the garbage where it belongs because he knows that there is no debt owed and he never contracted to pay me $1,000 to mow his lawn. If you do have a relationship with a party, say the DMV, to register your car, now when you, they send you a notice to pay $150 to register your car and you don't respond, they will move to collect the debt. But what if I send them a counterclaim? After all, they are claiming to be in contract with me. They're making the claim that there's some, somehow a contract and somehow a debt owed. My counterclaim would have a notarized affidavit wherein I would state it is my belief that I have no liability to pay them $150 and they have, will have to show proof of claim that they are entitled to collect that debt. What do you think they will do? When you start to challenge authority on its claims of having authority under the law, you quickly find that they are full of hot air and won't show any factual evidence key word there is factual evidence. You have any debt to them. The IRS, I mean, if it's not factual evidence, then it's their opinion. You'll get lots of opinion. You know, you owe this money. Okay, prove it. You owe this money. I told you. You owe this money. See, that's an opinion. I, ha I can have the same opinion. You owe me a million dollars. That's my opinion. There's no factual evidence to support the claim. I will send them an affidavit and self-executing contract where they will have to show proof of claim that I am a taxpayer, a United States citizen, can define the term income, can show I have a lawful debt on the fruit of my own labor, can show how under the, under the, the United States Constitution they arrive at the ability to tax the people. Now, notice I said people, not citizens. They have a right to tax citizens. They don't have a right to tax the people. Now let's look at some superior court decisions and IRS codes around taxing, where it says, silence can only be equated with fraud, where there is a legal or moral duty to speak, or where an inquiry left unanswered would be intentionally misleading. We cannot condone this shocking behavior by the IRS, by the IRS, our revenue system is based upon the good faith of the taxpayer. Now this is actually a Supreme Court case, okay? Oh, excuse me, not a Supreme Court case, <clears throat> but it's a, a case from court. And the taxpayer should be able to expect the same from government in its enforcement and collection activities. This sort of deception will not be tolerated, and if this is the routine, it should be corrected immediately. And that's from U.S. versus Tweel, 550 F. 2nd, 297, 299. 299 is the page that you would find the quote on from 1977. So then let's look at some more case law. Tax liability is a condition precedent to the demand. Merely demanding payment, even repeatedly, does not cause liability. So isn't that what I said? You're going to have to prove liability. You can make all the demands you want. That's opinion. For this, the condition precedent of liability to be met, there must be a lawful assessment, either a voluntary one by the taxpayer, and this is where they get you, because 
They use your testimony as true. So it's a voluntary one. You signed the 1040. Or one properly, procedurally proper by the IRS. Because this country's income tax system is based on voluntary self-assessment rather than distraint. Hey, we're not going to come after you with a gun because you don't pay. I mean, that's the law. Is the law followed, though? Right? And that's from Flora versus United States, 362 U.S. 145. That is a Supreme Court decision. So then we have, let's go to the next one. That this country, that, th that it is contrary to the law of nature, slavery, will scarcely be denied that every man has a natural right to the fruits of his own labor is generally admitted and that no other person can rightfully deprive him of those fruits and appropriate them against his will. So you're entitled to the fruit of your labor and somebody in order to take your money is going to have to demonstrate that you have a liability and a debt to them seems to be the necessary result of this admission. But from the earliest times, war has existed, and war confers rights in which all have acquiesced. What's acquiesced? We give an in. We didn't, if, it, if we didn't acquiesce, what would we do? We'd still be at war, wouldn't we? <clears throat> Among the most enlightened nations of antiquity, one of these is that the victor might enslave the vanquished. This, which was the usage of all, could not be pronounced repugnant to the law of nations, which is certainly to be tried by the test of general usage. That which is, was received, the assent of all, must be the law of all. And that's the Antelope 23 U.S. 66. This is a Supreme Court decision from 1825. And as you see, every man has the right to the fruit of his labor. That's it. And then we go down to... The fruits of the thing belong to its owner, although they may have been produced by the work and labor of a third person, or from seeds sown by him on the owner's reimbursing such person for his expenses. In other words, the person who pays for it owns it. But the thing I like about that is the fruit of the thing belongs to its owner. And then let's look at some uh, internal revenue code. This is Title 26, is the Internal Revenue Code, and on 7701, definitions 14, taxpayer. The term taxpayer means any person subject to the internal revenue tax. Now, once again, what's the definition of person? You know, I love how the lawyers are sneaky about using words that you're not familiar with, that make you think that you have a liability. But they would have to prove, in order to call you a taxpayer, they would have to prove that, first of all, that you're a person, and second of all, that you're subject to the internal revenue tax with factual evidence. So then we look at 26 U.S.C. 7701, definitions, person. The term person shall be construed to mean and include. The word include means it only means the thing that follows anybody to believe me. So this is right out of Black's Law. Inclusio unius est exclusio alteris. The inclusion of one is the exclusion of another. The certain designation of one person is absolute exclusion of all others. So when we say the word includes only means the words that follow the words includes. Like if you said this room includes the chairs, then legally only the chairs would be um, what you're speaking about. Whereas we use the includes as in addition to. Like the room includes the chairs, you're not going to say the room doesn't have a table in it and doesn't have paintings on the walls and everything else. You're just going to say that in addition to everything else that's in the room, the chairs are in the room. But from a legal standpoint, it would only mean the chairs if you said includes the chairs. It excludes everything else. An individual, a trust, an estate, a partnership, an association, company, or corporation. Now we notice that every single one of those things is a fictional entity. The only one that you could possibly 
think that is not a fictional entity is individual. So you'd have to have the definition of individual here to be man and woman. Otherwise, I'm going to say that every one of those things is a fictional entity. And here we have from Black's Law the definition of individual. And you can see where I have it highlighted here. But it is said that this restrictive significant signification is not necessarily inherent in the world and that it may, in proper cases, include artificial persons. So there you have it. I mean, there's a huge difference between a man, woman, and an artificial person. An artificial person's a corporation, or a trust, or something like that. How can you not make a distinction between man and woman, living things, and fictional entities? And I hope it, hope it's true, but I'm not a fictional entity. You know, I'm flesh and blood. The revenue laws are a code or system in regulation of tax assessment and collection. They relate to taxpayers and not to non-taxpayers. Now, you understand this is a court case. They relate to taxpayers and not to non-taxpayers. The latter are without their scope. They have no force on them. Now, procedure is prescribed for non-taxpayers and no attempt is made to annul any of their rights. Suddenly, non-taxpayers have rights. I'll bet you taxpayers only have privileges because they're 14th Amendment citizens. And remedies in due course of law. With them, Congress does not assume to deal. And they are neither, and they are neither the subject nor the object of the revenue laws. And that is from... Court of Claims, Economy, Plumbing, and Heating versus United States. So now, are you a person? Do you see where the definition of person is exclusively a fictional entity? This makes sense when you understand that the 14th Amendment created United States citizens who are persons. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. Let's read it. If we don't question the law to see if they apply to us, we are acquiescing to the state of things. Acquiescing means we're okay with the way things are and we're not challenging them. We're not objecting. Even if you know the IRS will abuse you in court for not paying a tax, there's a huge difference between having evidence that they ignored your demands for clarification and proof that you are indeed a taxpayer and having no evidence to challenge them on. I have a First Amendment right to redress a grievance. It's one of the rights in the First Amendment. And that means the government is obligated to answer my grievances and not to ignore them. But if I sue for a redress of grievance as a citizen of the United States, do you see how foolish that would be? I'm going to state that I'm subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, but I'm demanding my rights to be heard and have my grievance redressed. Uh, that was done recently by We the People. and Bob Schultz's group sued the government, but they sued them as people. I mean, as um, citizens of the United States. They did not sue them as we the people. <laughs> You'd think he would know better, since his website says we the people. But of course, this only applies if I'm a freeman and not a taxpayer slave. Citizens of the United States, as we have seen, have no rights. They can only use civil rights, which are really privileges. And the courts have ruled that, that's, that your civil rights are privileges granted by the government. So how does the IRS tax us? Let's look at some of the arguments the federal government can make in their defense. Now, these are not verified because the government actually will never give you any answers. You can ask them, but they don't tell you. They won't give you the factual evidence of anything. And they certainly aren't going to make any claims that um, you know, if you do this and this and this, you can get out of paying taxes. So, the first one, that you are a taxpayer. You never stated you weren't a taxpayer. 
and instead you proudly became the willing voluntary member of that group when you filed tax forms, i.e. the 1040. The 1040 is a tax form. Only taxpayers file tax forms. You stated on the 1040 that you were testifying against yourself by swearing under penalties of perjury. Read the line. Penalties, not penalty. Penalties of perjury. I find that very odd. Two, that you are a resident. This is a special status signifying you are a United States citizen and live in the all capital state of California, all capital Alameda County, or the all capital city of San Rafael, etc. You cannot live in a corporation. That's impossible. And yet all those named entities are corporations. So what's the difference? You live on, on the land, in the physical boundaries, within the physical boundaries of the county of Alameda. You can't live in the county of Alameda. That's an impossibility. Or the city of San Rafael, the state of California, in all caps. You live on the land in a physical location described by the section, township, and range, or latitude and longitude, which describes a physical on-the-land location rather than a fictitious location. Your person is a legal fiction and can live in a corporation. I mean, when your all capital letter name is a legal fiction, legal fictions, which are imaginary things, you know, a piece of paper can contain a legal fiction on it, right? It's the lawyers that drew up the trust. What is the trust? The trust is a piece of paper with a description of what the trust duties and obligations are. It's a contract. I can't live in a contract. So the zip code is an indicator that you are a resident and are an, an IRS, in an IRS district within the federal United States because Congress can only rule over areas that it controls. So Congress has jurisdiction over you if you have a zip code and you live in a two-letter fictional entity such as all capital CA. You notice how they want you to write your state as CA? If you go fill out any form on the computer, they will not let you fill out the form unless it translates California into CA instead of the Republic of California. Now we see the deception where we testify we are citizens of the United States, we are taxpayers, we are residents, we live in instead of on the city of San Rafael or the county of Alameda. If you are a resident and have a zip code, you are authorizing the federal government to have jurisdiction over you and serve you legal paperwork. You see? So let's look and see if uh, I can find you know, some evidence that they created districts. Law University, and this is U.S. Code uh, 76201, which is Title 26, right? And we see in there that they created internal revenue districts. Establishment and alteration. The president shall establish convenient internal revenue districts for the purpose of administrating the internal revenue laws. Now, where can he, where can he put internal revenue districts in? I mean, the only place that they have any authority and jurisdiction over in Washington, D.C. is the 10 square miles that is Washington, D.C. and the properties which are territories and possessions. Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands. These are the places that they can use. So you can uh, send the postmaster a letter saying that you revoke your resident status and that you have changed your status to one of a non-military peaceful inhabitant. Because that's what I am. I'm a non-military peaceful inhabitant, a native son born in the state of California, the Republic of California. And so I had a stamp made up, <clears throat> and this is an example of my stamp. So you see where I am John Doe, sui juris, non-resident, non-domestic. Non-domestic means I'm not within 
the United States. And this is a big deal because if you're within the United States, like I said, you're a resident of the United States, it, you live in the United States, you can't live in a corporation. So the, there's a big difference, this Alice in Wonderland world between reality and fiction. As, in reality, you're a living man or woman and you live on the land. As a fiction, you're a person and you live within a corporation. The corporation is the one that created you. The corporation created through the birth certificate and whatnot, you. So I have a latitude and a longitude and I um, am care of, C-O, care of, not at the address and the, and the street and I live near the, the fictional in the, in the California Republic and in the United States of America, which the United States of America, or the United States for America, of 1792 is completely different than the United States Incorporated, in all capital letters. Now, under the Universal Postal Union, which the United States has a treaty with, you have to identify the country that you are sending something from, and the party that is receiving it has to have their country identified. California is actually a country. So anyway, <clears throat> these are just little, you know, interesting notes, and in, we're discussing how the IRS takes, has wants to put forth that they have the right to take your property, which is the fruit of your labor. So what does it cost to revoke your voter registration? See, if, you're a, if, you're, if you sign up as a voter, not an elector, right? Because the people elect representatives, voters vote for them. So I can cancel, what's it going to cost me to cancel my voter registration, my birth certificate, my residency, my U.S. citizenship? <clears throat> I don't know. I personally don't see it as having any downside, as I am a native-born son of the Republic of California and have all the inherent rights, God-given rights, that that status entails. Of course, the slave masters want me to suffer for the revocation of the slave status, and the punishment is they want you to not be able to survive without a slave card. So, the slave card's not really voluntary then, is it? It's not voluntary to get a social security number if you can't get a job anywhere unless you produce one. It's no longer voluntary. <clears throat> Even though they, that the law says that they cannot demand to see a social security number for identification purposes, your boss will not hire you unless you produce a social security number. It's too much trouble for him. He doesn't want any problems with the IRS. The banking cartel is the core group. The IRS considers that to ha you to have a privilege when you use the private form of money created by the Federal Reserve. A Federal Reserve note is not money. It's a private form of script, a bill of credit, unlawfully created under the Constitution. Money, in usual and ordinary accent, acceptation. It means gold, silver, or paper money used in circulating medium of exchange and does not embrace notes, bonds, evidences of debt, or other personal or real estate. Lane versus Raley, 280 Kentucky 319. And yet it passes as money and they consider it a privilege to use it. You know, as if survival is a privilege. If you sign a bank card, you give power of attorney to the bank to take any funds of yours and give them to the IRS or the FTB, the Franchise Tax Board. Check out your signature card and see if you can find any interesting statements now that you are better informed as to the meaning of United States citizen and resident, etc. If you want to keep all your labor, then you must stamp any checks you deposit into your account utilizing your rights under Title 12, Section 411. You are not using Federal Reserve notes for a private privilege, and the IRS cannot use that, use that 
you use the alleged compelled benefit against you. Let's take a look at what I do on my, my stamp. And this goes on the back of any check I deposit in, into my bank account. Now, a lot of banks could get excited about you doing this because what this means is this that you're redeeming lawful money under the Constitution. Read Title 12, USC, Section 411. And I sign it with my signature, DBA is doing business as the all caps name, because the bank account's in the name of the all caps person. It's not in your upper and lower case. And whenever they send you statements, it's going to be in your all caps name. So you are not ever going to be allowed to take out a bank account in your upper and lower case name. You can get checks with your upper and lower case name printed on the checks, which would probably be a good idea. So let's look at um, Title 12, Section 411, Issuance to Reserve Banks, Nature of Obligation and Redemption. Okay, Federal Reserve Notes to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for the purpose of making advances and blah, blah, blah. The real important part here is here right at the bottom where it says, they shall be redeemed in lawful money on demand at the Treasury Department of the United States in the city of Washington, District of Columbia, or at any Federal Reserve Bank. Redeemed in lawful money, that means I should be able to take my $100 Federal Reserve note down to the Federal Reserve Bank and have them give me $100 in gold or silver, because gold and silver are lawful money under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 and 10. Right? But they will refuse to redeem them. So my position is, is that when I take my paycheck down and deposit it, I am redeeming lawful money, re Title 12, Section 411. What happens when I do this? If I put $100 into, the, into my account, it's lawful money, United States currency, and it's not Federal Reserve notes. It's to be seen as lawful money. If it was a Federal Reserve note, they can loan out 10 times that amount, or 20 times, or 30 times that amount. They can do fractional reserve banking because you just put private money into their, into their hands. But when, they put, when you put U.S. currency into their hands, they can't use it as an elastic form of money. And of course, you know, the bank's not going to like that too much. At this point, the bank has not complained about my doing it. The other aspect of this is that if you do this, then at the end of the year, when the IRS comes along to you and says, hey, you made $40,000 last year, yes, like, excuse me, I deposited lawful money. I didn't deposit Federal Reserve notes. And this is, this is a case where you have an argument that the, that the IRS cannot tax you for the privilege. It's an excise tax on the use of Federal Reserve notes. Well, I didn't use any Federal Reserve notes. I exchanged my paycheck for U.S. currency, printed by the Treasury Department, not printed by the Federal Reserve. It's not private form of issue of money. I know these are probably a little esoteric in the, in the terms, but I'm trying to present information so that, so that somebody could see in action what's really going on. Using Federal Reserve notes is a privilege and that they're claiming that you have an excise tax for the use of those, or at least they would like to claim that. And one way of stopping that claim is by doing that stamp on the back of your check. Another way would be, let's say you were paid in silver. Okay, so a silver dollar is worth uh, $30 today, and your paycheck was, uh, let's say, $600. 20 silver dollars. Okay, so I got paid 20 silver dollars. I got paid $20. Because it says right on there, it's a dollar. So what's my tax on $20? Well, at the end of the year, 50, 50 weeks at uh, $20 a week, that's $1,000. I'm way under the radar of having to pay any taxes. Of course, I would not want to file a 1040. I would want to file a declaration stating that 
I made $1,000 last year, and it's not taxable. We all create the reality we want. If we fail to object to what is stated or another's actions, then we're okay with them. If you want, it, if you want this to change, the only party that <coughs> is going to make this change is you. I hear people all the time state that once more people become aware of this or that injustice and complain about it to their representatives in Congress that we can have change. I mean, that is so ludicrous. The people in Congress don't represent us. That's obvious. I mean, if, if you have 92% of the people state that they don't want a TARP bailout and Congress goes for it anyway, you know, we live in a republic, not a democracy. In a democracy, 51% gets their way, but obviously in this land, it's the people with money and in power that are getting their way. You have a very, very extremely small group that are controlling 300 million people. So that's foolish thinking that the congressmen are going to do anything. The only one who can change anything is me. I mean, I have lots of opportunity to change things. I'm the only one that's interested with the energy and focus to make it happen. I can challenge the authorities to show proof of claim that I'm liable for taxes and that they can force me to accept a smart meter, that they can allow a large corporation to put MTBE in the gas, thus ruining the rubber engine parts in my lawnmower, or any of the other actions that those in power like to claim they have the authority to do. And if they fail to answer these grievances, then they have violated my rights outlined in the contract to honor the United States and state constitutions, and they owe me a monetary damage after I take them to court. All this is possible in a just world. And if I don't, I don't have any illusions that, there's, that this is a just world and that it operates under the rule of law. But I find most people are good people and have been deluded into believing that they have authority and that the government has authority and remarkably, and by their own admissions to me, they don't get challenged but once a year. I mean, I actually talked to a police officer and asked him how often he met somebody like me who knew his constitutional rights and demanded them. I said, like, well, like maybe every month or two? He goes, no, no, hardly ever. And I said, like once a year? And he said, yeah, maybe maybe once a year. So do you see how that's a problem? The problem is, is that most people don't know their rights under the Constitution, that the Constitution is a contract, that the people that work for the government made a declaration and a, and a solemn oath to that contract, and that once I accept that contract and they violate the contract, then there's a debt owed. What do we expect to happen if no one ever demands their lawful rights to be honored? I am the lone nut job who believes he has rights and can be treated as such because I'm so rare. Yeah, if I'm the lone nut job, then I'm not going to be treated very well. When 10% of the population starts making the, the same demands, then those who believe that they have authority start to see there is really an issue and it needs to be addressed, and they respond accordingly. Look at Egypt. If everyone stayed home and said, I'll protest when everyone else is out in the street and no one gets billy clubbed, then no one would go out and nothing, would have ch nothing changes. Can anyone honestly say they want a community where bullies get to take advantage of specific members of the community who challenge the bully's authority? Here I want to show a little evidence. Here we have a court case and you can see that it's filed and that uh, this is uh, Betty Richardson, United States Attorney, representing the United States, and Richard Ward, trial attorney from the Tax Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. <clears throat> and in this case, we are t we're talking, the plaintiff here is Diversified Metal Products Incorporated, and they're versus Tebow Company Trust, Internal Revenue Service, and Steve Morgan. And the important thing about this case here is, and you can see there, it's, there's your um, actual certification that this is a true and correct copy, right? You know, I'm not just making this stuff up. So we have here where you see where it says that they 
this is an answer to their claim. And in an answer, you have to step by step, you have to reply a response to each um, numbered statement in the claim. <clears throat> and uh, a response is either I admit, I deny, or I have no knowledge. So in number four, they said, denies that the Internal Revenue Service is an agency of the United States government. Oh my God, this is, this, this is the attorney for the Department of Justice and for the United States denying that the Internal Revenue is, Service is an agency of the United States government. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? And then here we have a letter from the Congress of the United States House of Representatives. And this is from, you know, the committee that this guy's on. And the name of the person here is Dennis Hertel, 14th District, Michigan. And in, in the letter, he's writing to state that regarding your recent contract with my office on the difficulties you are experiencing with the Internal Revenue Service, it is the policy of our office not to give legal advice and suggest you seek counsel with tax exp experts. We can address your specific question relating to IRS Form 668W. Notice of levy, right there, notice of levy on wages. So this guy was having his wages levied by the, by the Internal Revenue Service, right? And it states, levy may be made upon the accrued salary or wages of any officer, of any officer, right, employee, or elected official of the United States or the District of Columbia by serving notice of levy on the employee of such office employee or, or, or elected official, does not provide authority to levy wages of private citizens in the private sector. Get that? Now, most people that are having their wages levied are not employees of the United States or elected officials. However, the government would like to point out that you actually are an employee of the United States when you become a person and a United States citizen. Let's look at some more interesting little known facts. Here we have, these are all Title 26, Internal Revenue Service. And we have, we go down to definitions of wages. For the purpose of this chapter, the term wages means all remuneration for employment, including the cash value of all remuneration, including benefits paid in any medium other than cash, except that such terms shall not include B, various pre-tax deductions, B, employment. For the purpose of this ch chapter, the term employment means any service of whatever nature performed A, by an employee for the person employing him, irrespective of the citizenship or residence of either within the United States. Get that? It has to be within the United States. And what, and what do we know the United States is? A corporation. Can you be a, if you're a person, you can be part of that corporation. Or, I, I, in or in connection with an American vessel or American aircraft. Are you an American vessel? Well, could be. Then we go to outside the United States by a citizen or resident of the United States. So you have to be a citizen or resident of the United States to be taxed with wages as an employee for an American employer. And then we go to state, United States, and Puerto Rican citizen for the purpose of this chapter, state. Now when you say state, you mean California. The term state includes, and that means it excludes everything else. It only, it means the things that follows it. The District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. Now, and you thought state meant Texas or Oregon, but in, in Title 26, the term state means the District of Columbia or its possessions. The term United States, when used in a geographical sense, that means physical land boundaries, includes the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. 
wow. And you thought the geographical United States was all 50 states. But no, that's not true. Under the Internal Revenue Code, that's not true. And here we have Cornell Law University again, U.S. Code. This is Title 31, Subtitle 2, Chapter 13, Subchapter 2, 1321, right? Trust funds. And we look at number two, Philippine Special Fund Internal Revenue. Now, why would the Internal Revenue be a special fund in the Philippines? Is that odd? Then we go up to, you know, there's 34. We're going to turn the page over and we're going to go to 35 and we'll go down to 62. Puerto Rico Special Fund Internal Revenue. Once again, we have a Puerto Rico Special Fund, a trust, that is the Internal Revenue. Why would the Internal Revenue have a trust fund in Puerto Rico? Why not have a trust fund in Washington, D.C.? And why would the IRS need a trust fund at all? Isn't it just a government agency? So there's a lot of things that make for interesting reading in their own books, right? Do they follow their own laws? Well, that, you know, you can make the case. And um, look at what Paul Mitchell has to say. And Paul Mitchell has uh, a lot of absolutely excellent information. If you want to read about the IRS, and the, um, what they do and how they operate, I uh, recommend you go to supremelaw.org and look at Paul Mitchell's stuff. Supremelaw.org. So he has 31 questions, and I like his 31 questions. One, is the Internal Revenue Service an organization within the United States Department of the Treasury? Well, I just showed you the diversified metal products uh, court case wherein the lawyers stated that they weren't, right? The answer is no. The IRS is not an organization within the United States Department of the Treasury. The United States Department of the Treasury was organized by statutes now codified in Title 31 of the United States Code. The only mention of the IRS anywhere in 31 U.S.C. 301 through 313 is an author authorization for the president to appoint an assistant general counsel in the United States Department of the Treasury to be chief counsel for the IRS. That would be lawyer. At footnote 23, in the case of Chrysler Corporation versus Brown, 441 U.S. 281 in 1979, the United States Supreme Court admitted that no organic act for the IRS could be found. In other words, they were never given any authority by Congress after they searched for an act all the way back to the Civil War, which was ended in the year 1865 A.D. The Guarantee Clause in the United States Constitution guarantees the rule of law to all Americans, of course, not to U.S. citizens. We are to be governed by law and not by arbitrary bureaucrats. See Article 4, Section 4. Since there is no organic act creating it, the IRS is not a lawful organization. Two, if not an organization within the United States Department of the Treasury, then what exactly is the Internal Revenue Service? Answer, the Internal Revenue Service appears to be a collection agency working for foreign banks and operating out of Puerto Rico under color of the Federal Alcohol Administration, FAA. But the FAA was promptly declared unconstitutional inside the 50 states by the US, US Supreme Court in the case of US versus Constantine, 296 US 287, because prohibition had already been repealed. The Internal Revenue Service has no corporate charter to operate in any state. If you ask the Secretary of State to provide a corporate charter showing the Internal Revenue Service has the right to operate within your state, you're going to be surprised to find out that they don't. In 1998, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit identified a second Secretary of the Treasury as a man by the name of Manuel Diaz Saldana. If you think that's funny, look on a Federal Reserve note on the left side where you can see, um, here, let's show you, all right, and here we look close and we see the Timothy F. Geithner is the Secretary of the Treasury in the right corner, right? Well, what happens when we look in the left corner? It's Rosa Guamat 
Fertile Riva, Rios, treasurer of the United States. How can you have two treasurers of the United States? And who ever recognized uh, Miss Rios as being treasurer? I mean, Timothy Geithner, we all know as treasurer, but who is ever recognized somebody other than Timothy Geithner as being treasurer? If you don't find this interesting, then, you know, I'm, I'm just, when I realized what was going on, it was like, oh my God. With, when all the evidence is examined objectively, the IRS appears to be a money laundry extortion racket and conspiracy to engage in a pattern of racketeering activity in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1951 and 1961 ETSEC RICO, the RICO Act. Think of Puerto Rico, Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Activ Organizations Act. In other words, it is an organi organized crime syndicate operating under false and fraudulent pretenses. Paul Mitchell's website at http www.supremelaw.org. I highly recommend you go into Paul Mitchell's site and reading the information he has. He has his book, The Federal Zone, you can read for free. The other book that is interesting to read is Cracking the Code by Pete Hendrickson. He has a lot of good information in there, but it's not, you know, I don't follow everything he does to the T, of course.